Transferring wealth successfully starts with asking yourself questions that will give your family a better life now and for generations to come. In this podcast, financial professionals John and Michael from Copper Beach Financial Group guide you through eye-opening questions to help you discover the truth about your wealth. Now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to The Truth About Wealth with John and Michael Paris of Copper Beach Financial Group. Michael, how are you this morning? I am good, Eric. How are you? I am doing fantastic. John, I know you're kicking this podcast off. How are you, my friend? Yes, sir, Eric. I'm doing great. How's, how you, how's the family doing? Everybody's doing well on your side? Yeah, everybody's doing well. It's, it's just a wonderful time of year to to reconnect with some family we haven't talked to in a while and, and get to spend some more time with the family we're around. Holidays are coming. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So you're kicking off today's podcast. What is the subject of the podcast today? Yeah, Michael and I were, were talking last week and, and it, we thought it was about time that we, we do another case study. Uh, we, we periodically think through cases that could have impact on listeners. Uh, and this is one case that really set that bar a little higher. And, it, and, it, and it's really uh, frustrating for us when we, we meet families and they are in the pickle they're in because either they've dropped the ball or they didn't pay attention uh, or they didn't get the right advice from their team of advisors. So we get thrown into that mix match and we try to fix it. So we are talking about a case that we uh, just brought on uh, as a family to Copper Beach. And uh, I thought we'd give a little history of the case and what we've done to hopefully fix some of the issues and some of the conversations we've had with the family and, and, and the team that we're working with. Uh, on the advisory side. So I thought we'd, we'd, we'd talk about that. I would love yeah. that. Now, I do want to point out to the listening audience that something you said, John, right there, that you were able to kind of help fix some of the issues. Yeah. And if, for those that have not heard a lot of the podcasts, go back and listen to the content that these gentlemen are putting out and the guests that they've had because it's so complex. And I'm just saying that from my own purview, but it's so complex, the stuff that you guys do. Families don't know what questions to ask a lot of times. They don't know what they don't know. And you've said that on this podcast so many times that I love the fact that you kind of let off with that because even if a lot of things are going well in a scenario, there's always things that can be fixed and can be better. So I I love that. Yeah. And, and, and I'll, I'll let Michael jump in here in a few seconds, but it's, it's about procrastination. We've talked about that in the past. Everybody kind of pushes things aside, but when you have a successful company or you're, you're an affluent family, you have to really watch what's going on because, um, you could, you could miss some steps along the way and cause major problems to G2 and G3. And and you know how we think we always do planning around the generation. So if you don't fix G1, right, it affects G2 and potentially G3 at a high level. So this is actually one of that, you know, one of those scenarios where we came across a, uh, a family that was referred to us by a very good client of ours. And then we started our uh, audit process with them. And through the through the audit, we obviously discover where the uh, where the holes might might be. And this was no exception. Um, the family's a, a very successful family. Uh, G2 runs the company. Uh, G1 had all the control um, uh, through the years, which was a good thing and, and not a good thing. Um, Along the discovery um, through the data, we had conversations with with G two, and they said, "Well, we have all these issues, these problems. How come my team, my advisory team, didn't uh, uh, let us know about this?" And and it's always uncomfortable for us because we don't want to blame the advisors um, uh, initially in, in the in the discussions because we want to work with the team they currently have. So it was a discovery like tell me about your relationship with your advisors apparently it was the firm that i know very well um and what happened was they uh, did a, a pretty good job doing the estate planning um but through discovery we found out that the the problem occurred with dad didn't want to make any changes when he was approached 15 years ago to do some advanced planning so that again uh that that control side of things from g1 caused the problem for this family because he didn't want to let go of the, the control of the company. Uh, although the, all the advisors recommended he need, need to do some advanced estate planning and he decided not to. So hence, you know, 15 years later, the company has grown substantially and those problems just compounded. Yeah. I think this case, like a lot of cases that we work on and families that we work with is, you know, really 
the, the old saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I think that this is a prime example of that in terms of when you're looking at this advanced planning, and then we're, we'll talk a lot about the estate planning side of the equation for this particular family, that it really pays to pay attention to this earlier on. So as you, you mentioned, uh, the the last 15 years uh, or 15 years prior to this, as we found out, there were some discussions that the legal team in this case had with the family uh, that that the family um, decided to not move forward with for one reason or another. But that has now created, I think, uh, again, a, a greater problem. I say greater problem. Well, I think it is a greater problem a greater in a problem. lot of ways, but makes it a little bit more difficult for us and the advisor team to help get the family into a good position that, again, if they had looked at this 15 years ago, probably would have been a lot easier and and just less costly really overall to fix everything. So that's, again, for those listeners, we've talked about it a lot. It always pays to start looking at this earlier, this type of planning. And that's a challenge for a lot of our families because they're running successful companies and you know, I know this, particularly raising young kids, is you, you don't have <laughs> not enough hours in the day to do everything. And so this, unfortunately, is an additional responsibility that a lot of families uh, have. They might not realize that they have it, but to do this type of planning, if they want to minimize, you know, generational taxes and they want to prepare the next generation to inherit the business or take over the business, that that requires a lot of work and responsibility. So again, that's what Copper Beach is is here to help families with. But uh, that anyway, this is going to be, I think, a good illustration of those concepts. Yeah. So as we started discovering a little deeper, um, we met with all the advisors. You know our process, Eric. We 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 bring the team in. Mm -hmm. It's a collaborative effort. We all talk about the issues or whatever. So it was a, it was a fantastic meeting. Lawyers came in, CPAs came in with our team, and we had a discussion on all the issues. And the, and all the family was there. So the clients saw the team approach to resolving some of the issues and everyone walked away from the table with a game plan or how to fix uh, the problem that existed. Uh, so if, from a collaborative standpoint, it's working extremely well, wonderful team of advisors. They know what our role is. You know, we act, act as that architect and they're like subcontractors. So they, they, they understand that. Uh, and, uh, and, and we're moving forward with some good ideas um, as, as we look at the planning for each generation. Now, one of the things we, we always talk about is, when you when you start planning, um, you have to really look at all the all the options you have. And what we did, we spent probably what a couple of meetings, Michael, with all the estate options on whether they do grats or defective trusts or the gift or they do all the advanced planning mm -hmm. that we do. And we went through all that discussion. And again, back to the team of advisors, they obviously understood all that and they agreed that we had to look at all those components. And and we're in the process of doing that now. Uh, one of the dynamic things that we we do, as you know, Eric, is that we do projections that go out a lot of years because you really have to look at the world differently from today to versus tomorrow because if you're worth $5 million today, if you do some decent investing or you grow your assets on an average rate of return, let's say 7 8%, the rule of 72 says if I get a certain rate of return on my portfolio, Divided by number seventy-two, it's going to be tell me how many years that asset is, is going to you know, you know double in value. Mm -hmm. So we do that projection. When we sat with G two. He had an enormous net worth. What? But when he was 30, 30 years from now, Mike, I can't. Oh remember. yeah, when he was in his sixties and seventies. Yeah, and and he looked at the the tax burden that he had to his children. He almost fell off his chair. And some of the planning we did uh, to show him where we could fix it, we took that tax that it had was enormous, and we cut it down like eighty percent. And wow. he was over he was over overwhelmed that we could do that. Now a couple of pieces had to come together to make that happen, but but as we move forward with the case, the advisory community has agreed to change some of these state planning recommendations on how these trusts are created to ch make those changes on the tax side. Uh, I won't get into the weeds on, on on the technical side, but by doing certain trust structures or selling assets of certain trusts, you you reduce the tax burden generationally. So we spent a lot of time, probably two, three meetings just on that topic alone, and everybody's in, in, in step. So we have G1 
doing their estate plan, coordinating that with G2 and and ultimately to G3. So we're in that really good phase right now, trying to get all our our arms wrapped around the generations. And so far, we've had some significant impact on the the tax side. Yeah, I think this case really illustrates two primary topics that we've talked, I think, a lot about on on podcast and prior episodes, one being asset protection and the other being generational, uh, in this case, estate tax uh, protection against because they, uh, again, we we look generationally with the family. So generation one had a sizable estate tax exposure and in their estate plan is leaving the assets, which is primarily the family business to the next generation and outside of trust. And so what this will, will do is now those assets are going to be included in Gen 2's estate for when they pass away. Now, they can certainly do some planning, which we're in the process of doing Gen 2 as well. But if nobody really pays attention to that, that's where you get this situation where you have generational estate tax exposure. So you have estate tax on Generation 1 side when it passes to Gen 2. And then because those assets are in Gen 2's estate, if they were to pass away, there's tax again to Gen 3 on Gen 2's passing. So it creates this generational estate tax exposure that if you structure your affairs properly and you do this advanced estate planning, you can create asset protected structures that under current law will never be uh, taxed at that Gen 2 to Gen 3 level. You could create those dynasty trusts, which I think we've cre- we've mentioned on other podcasts. But that's really how we think and again, illustrates a little bit of the different mindset that maybe we have versus some other advisors because the estate plan uh, that was put in place when we audited this family did not have those provisions in place. And so, you know, normally that would be perfectly fine for your average family. For this family that has a sizable estate and a successful business, it it creates these exposures. And And the other issue that we uncovered with this is that there was this generational tax and there was very little liquidity to pay for it outside of using the business's assets. And this is a thing that, again, I, perhaps sets us apart from other advisors when we do our audit and look at our projections, is that we're going to show the family, again, using that 7 8% growth rate that you mentioned, Dad, what that asset base will grow to over the next 30 years using, we think, pretty conservative assumptions. And if there's not enough liquidity to pay for that tax, that can create a lot of problems, again, particularly when you have a family business. And that's that's one of the, um, actually, I think it might be a good future podcast to discuss is this concept of cash flow and, and how do you use cash flow in a business context? Because this family, again, very successful, but they took a lot of the liquidity that they could otherwise take out of the business and they reinvested it back into the company to help grow it. Which they did been, a great job. They've been incredibly successful at doing that, but that has created this additional exposure that they didn't understand. Which is now we, they have so much illiquid value in their business, and they have this estate exposure that they weren't planning on, and really not a lot of assets to pay for it. And so that's again perhaps a little bit of a different mindset that we have when we look at families. That again, if you're going to be proactive. With, with looking at this and doing this advanced estate planning, you can prevent a lot of this. You just have to pay attention to it, which which is, again, what families hire us to do. Yeah, we had a, a funny meeting one day. We're talking to, to, to uh, the uh, CFO of the company and the and G2, and they were telling us that just did an acquisition. It's going to help grow the company tremendously. And I said, well, there's good news and bad news to that. And they said, oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> so, so going forward, how do you own these assets? How do you protect that tax problem? from occurring with the you know, you know, with the trust structures and how you own assets. So that's a, an investigation we're going through now and talking to the, uh, uh, the attorneys on in the future, on future purchases. How do they, how do they buy, buy those assets? And we'll, that's another conversation for another day, but we're in the, in the throes of doing that. This is actually an active case we're working on currently. Uh, we're not finished with this case. So I thought it was appropriate because we keep seeing these enormous issues with this tax side and asset protection side keep occurring in these larger families. And we, and we, you know, we try to fix that as, as best we can. Uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a challenge for, for the family to see all the components. You know, it's like eating a 10 pound marshmallow, you know, take little bites. 
And it's going to be, that's why it takes a couple of years for us to go through this process with families, because it is difficult. As you said earlier, it's not, you can't do this overnight. You have to look at all, you have to cross all the T's and dot all the I's or, or people freeze and don't make decisions. Mm -hmm. So to get that clarity, to get that, that, the right uh, process down allows the family to make good decisions going forward. If not, they just freeze and they said it's too complex or I don't understand it. Yeah, you know, I'm just going to push it aside and I'll worry about it tomorrow. And we hear those through, through our, through the years and we try to prevent that from happening. Yeah. It was interesting dynamic in, in this case is that the, the family had really a, a, a good succession plan in place from gen one to gen two, gen two, is really running the day-to-day -day operations of the company already before we met them, which is, again, a project that we often work on with families is how do I protect this, this business going to the next generation? Gen 1 wants to pass it to Gen 2. Gen 2 wants to take it over, but how do you do that in a, an effective way? This family had that already, so that that we think is, you know, is great. Uh, but what was interesting is that we're now it, at the point where, again, the, the value of the business because of this this tax exposure that was hanging out there that the family didn't plan for, it, it kind of influences that succession plan because the only asset base to be able to use to pay that tax is the business. So now we're jeopardizing the company as it passes to the next generation because of this tax exposure. But what I wanted to point out is we, we've had, been having a lot of meetings with the uh, CFO and, and vice president of the company, and he is very concerned about protecting this business because again Big time. he's the he's a key employee he he looks at this business as being a uh, you know a place he wants to spend the rest of his career and he wants to make sure that it's protected as well so obviously we focus a lot on the family side but the employees of a company are vital obviously and and they have a, a, a stake if you will in the success of the company as well so being able to protect that as it goes down the generational line is really important so it's it's in, it, it's great to see that with this family. Yeah, we've talked about in the past about having a proper buy sell agreement between partners uh, that could destroy not only uh, the relationship between the two partners' families, it's also if it's not done right, it affects all the employees because the company is not going to be around. Same thing on the estate planning side, on the succession side of these companies. You affect families that work for you for years. And this company has longtime employees that have been there for years. And then, by the way, that was a conversation we had when they want to protect that. Yeah, uh, but how do you do that? So we're again we're in the throes of all this discovery, and we're trying to wrap we're wrap our hands around all the complexity in this in, on, on this in this family, and we're and we're getting there. again getting back to that two year uh, process. It takes us a while to get all these all these bases covered. The good news is they trust their advisor team. They've said it multiple occasions. Listen, I hire you guys to think through this. I I think we think we have the best team out there. So fix it. So we're we're all, we're all the process of fixing it, but we're working really well with the advisors, which we always hope for. Yeah, I mean, you brought up an interesting dynamic that we haven't talked about yet on the business succession side. Is is Gen two, as I mentioned, is really running the day to day management. It's one G two member, so there's other G two members in this family that aren't actively uh, running the company and working in the company. And one of the business succession projects that will that I think we've resolved at this point is to be able to have an estate equalization issue, but also ensuring that the voting control of the company yeah. ends up in, a, in, a, in in the hands of in the family member, the Gen 2 family member that's really running the company, which was actually a great meeting we had because all the Gen 2 family members really agreed with this, this general structure, which was, again, wonderful. It's a great family to work with. But that is a dynamic that, again, if you're looking at, a family business in particular, and you have uh, one family member, one child that is really running that, that company, how does the voting control of that company pass to the next generation? Are you going to create a friction between siblings in terms of how that business is run? Because the, the Gen 2 member that is running the company really wants to make sure that he's able to really run the day-to-day make decisions and not have a future rift in the family cause the business to not be able to move according to the growth pattern that he really sees. And again, the other members that are not a part of the business agree wholeheartedly. However, they also want to make sure that they have some say in the, in the ultimate disposition 
of the company and certain large business projects. They want to have a say in that. So there's just all these dynamics issues that you uncover with family businesses in particular that you're trying to manage. Because really, I think at the end of the day, we don't often say this, but I feel like what we're really trying to do is maintain family harmony. Mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the business is sort of the asset that can create some frictions if it's not managed properly. So that was another uh, interesting design that we're that we're working with the legal team on is to try to make sure that the voting control of the company gets to the right hands, that the non-working members are protected, uh, and and that everybody sort of moves on again as a family, you know, with that harmonious relationship. Yeah, it, 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 we've talked about this before. When mom and dad are here, things seem to work well uh, ongoing. But when the core of the family, mom and dad, pass, now what? So the, these conversations are that now what? So we want to make sure we cover the understanding from both fronts on what mom and dad would like to have happen and what the kids like to have happen. And again, it's worked out in this family fairly well uh, and very efficiently because everyone seems to be on the same page. It's a very, very nice family to work with. But you want, you still want to protect those mistakes from being made with you didn't you didn't mention something you should have and what if that's that happens well they never told me that and so we're trying to cover all those bases uh, to michael's point so it's it's a it's it's actually a lot of fun to get involved where that's where our, we put our psychiatrist hat on sometimes because it's hard to balance all the emotional sides of this uh but they they seem to do a great job yeah and, and the other dynamic with the the gen 2 members that are not involved in the company is they they want to have often, and it's not just this family, but a lot of the families we work with. They want to have their own autonomy outside of the business, right? They they don't, even though they want to maintain an ownership position and a say, they don't want to be defined by the business. And so there's other planning that you can do with that branch of the family to be able to protect them and give them their own own autonomy outside of the business, but still have them be involved. So there's a lot of dynamics issues. Again, that psychiatrist analogy yeah. that we've talked about a lot, I think makes a lot of sense here. Well, let me ask you a pretty complicated question. And, and it, this is, this family is a great example and you may not be to this point yet with them, but I'm sure you've experienced it. When I look at a family, I mean, obviously a family tree, you look at a kind of a pyramid, right? You got mom and mm -hmm. dad and then right. you've got a couple, you know, let's say three kids. And each of those three kids have two or three kids. Let's just say three because that's fun math, right? So you've got three kids, each have uh, three kids. So now you've got nine grandchildren. So when you're talking going from Gen 1 to Gen 2, you, you mentioned that there's only one of the Gen 2 that's actually running the business. So you've got a couple others that are doing their own thing, whatever that is. But they all have kids. And looking forward to Gen 3, which I know you do, mm -hmm. how do you... And, and and also, I'm going to bring in one more complexity here, which you guys, again, deal with all the time. I'm going to start charging you. I know, right? Hey, <laughs> so you've got that, uh, you've got, you know, the folks that are working in the business that are not family that want to make sure that the business is successful because even though they don't have any ownership at this point, right, of it because Gen 2 has that, even though they don't have ownership, that's their livelihood. They believe in the company, obviously, because they're there and they want to stay there and they know that this is going to be their career for their lifetime. Right. So how do you help them balance out how it's fair for all the grandchildren? Also, if any of them choose to or not choose to work in there, work inside the business, um, while also maintaining the ability for the people that work there that are not family to know that it's secure into that following generation or, or whatever. So there's a fairness issue that you guys have mm -hmm. talked about equal versus fair. There's a whole different yep. game there, but when you're looking at that gen three, how do you do that? How do you balance it out beyond gen two? That's a, th that's a huge project. Let me um, start and yeah. you can finish. <laughs> uh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we've already had conversations about that because here's a question. G2 runs the company. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens if G2 goes? Yeah. So we, we're, we're having those discussions. And, and it is. What, and by goes, you mean, you know, pass, passes away. away Charlie right. becomes disabled, right? Those. Right. Those what happens to the company? So there's a good management team in place. And, and the client did share with us that he believes he's got a very good management team in place that could keep the company running. But but can they really do that? So, so there's, a, there's a G2 risk of. If they pass away prematurely, he passed away prematurely. There's a, there's a, there could be a potential. Now what with mm -hmm. the company? Now the company's 
valuable enough that probably could be sold. And we talked about that as well. And everyone walks away with uh, the proceeds and life goes on. Um, but to answer your question more specifically, that's where the trusts come into play. We talked about that in the past. Mm-hmm. We've introduced a, uh, a trust company to be involved in this decision. Now, I'll t- to tell you about that conversation. Everybody, and probably everyone on this call is, is not excluded from that. We'd like to have a personal trustee involved in these estate decisions as, as we're no longer here. The challenge you have is when you deal with, with affluence, there's a big chunk of assets in these trusts. I'll give you an example. If there's $100 million in a trust and there's one tr- one trustee managing it and he happens to be an attorney or a CPA or a friend of the family's, tell me how he's, tell me what's the fiduciary obligations on that? Managing $100 million. Mm-hmm. He's got to worry about the investment side of it, distribution side of it, honor to what the trust says. And they get to a point where this is way too big for me. I need to do something different. So I'm going to resign as trustee. You guys need to find someone else. So the challenge you have on some of the growth of these uh, families that we work with is how do you manage all that? So what we try to accomplish is create a corporate trustee, which is a trust company, work side by side with a personal trustee trustee to to help mitigate that problem from happening down the road. So we're in the process of doing that as we speak. As a matter of fact, we're going to have a meeting pretty soon on that topic with them. So, so as you can see, it does get a little complex, but that trust is going to manage that G3. I want to make sure we don't miss that. No, nothing really pours out of this trust. That's our recommendation at this point. And they agree. It's managed by these trustees for the benefit of the third generation, potentially. There's also a discussion on the buy-sell side that do they, do they want to get into the business somewhere down the road, they'll, they'll be able to do that on both sides of the family. So this is, this is I used to think that's real big error. <laughs> it yeah. gets complex, and all these components have to be addressed. Yeah, that's it's why it's an ongoing project um, for this family in, in particular, because the Gen 3 family members are, I think all of them are under 10 years old. So to... Yeah. To talk about the third generation getting into the business is a little premature mm-hmm. uh, at this point, but that's why it's an ongoing project, right? Because at some point, you know, even 15, 16 years old, they might want to at least start having those conversations depending on, uh, you know, who that family member is. In fact, the G2 member that's running the company has always told us that, you know, when he was young and started in the business working mm-hmm. in, you know, the mail room, I think he was always you know, fascinated with the company and always wanted to, you know, really learn about it and, and run it someday. So he was very driven for that, but not every family member might have that same drive. So you have to uncover that. And, and, you know, is that it should the business even pass to the third generation? Right. I mean, that's a a question that, you know, oftentimes families um, might want to have that happen. They might want to have the business go to the third generation, but is Gen 3 really ready to take it over? Which gets back to your point, Dad, about the management company and making sure that there might be a way to, you know, create that protection in place until Gen 3 might be ready to start the or, or taking over the company. So you have all these ongoing discussions around, you know, not the technical topics here, but this is just more of the softer family side, side yeah. family side in terms of what's really best for the family. And as you pointed out, Eric, when you start, increasing the number of in this example cousins that are really involved in running the company you know who's in charge what happens if you have you know three members of the gen 3 that want to run the business right that's the natural succession of of companies how do you put all that together it's a it's a big challenge there's no right answer to it but it it, it's it's hard yeah i'm going to circle back to the liquidity conversation michael started with with first kicked off the podcast because that's been the the issue in this case and I, I won't get into too much of the detail of it but remember 15 years ago when the advisors approached uh, mom and dad to to start doing advanced planning insurance is recommended to create some liquidity to cover any tax exposure they might have had but the tax numbers were way different 15 years ago than they are now mm-hmm. but the fact that they said they didn't want to buy any life insurance they were they were going to push it aside now they want to buy life insurance Mm-hmm. And they're older, oh, yeah. and they're not well. So we're in the process of trying to design a strategy. And again, I won't get into the weeds, where we're going to ensure all three generations. And the ho- whole idea is that is is to go back to the insurance companies that's probably already have declined mom and dad because they're not well. We're going to try to combine G two and G three in part of that package approach, 
they'll allow them to put some coverage on G1 to cover the tax problem. And the insurance company looks at the profit margin on G2 and G3. So we're, we're doing some very creative designs on structure on the insurance liquidity side. We're not sure where that's going to end up. We're, we're in the throes of that now. But if we if we had accomplished this, and by the way, the family's very, very, very excited and, and, and focused on hopefully we get that in place because they understand that without the liquidity, when mom and dad pass, they have a major issue. Either they have to borrow money from their banks to pay the tax, or they have to use what we've in the tax code, that 6166 uh, um, strategy that the government lends you the money or floats you for 14 years to pay the tax. But it causes all kinds of stress in the company. So they're trying to eliminate that, uh, that, that, that bad side of it and try to get some liquidity used in the insurance. So we're, we're, we're really, really down to the wire trying to get coverage on mom and dad, but we have to go through G2 and G3 to make that happen. So it's an interesting design. Never had a design like that before We're working with one of our specialists, but we outsource and get, bring all the powerhouse people in when we need them. And this is one of those cases where we have a specialist on the West coast that's helping us do all this. And it's really, really fascinating. Yeah. I've, I've never heard anything even close to that. And that, boy, if that works out, that's a huge burden off their shoulders. That's awesome. It, it, it's enormous. It's absolutely enormous if we can accomplish this. Yeah, again, and to reiterate, just the the ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure type of conversation. That's why, you know, on the business succession side, the advanced estate planning side, when families ask us, when should I start doing it? it usually the answer is sooner rather than later or now, really. Mm-hmm. And and the insurance example is a, is a, a good one, I think, because yeah. it, insurance is always going to be cheaper to buy if you need to buy it. And that's part of the the planning process, at least in this case, as being a way to help pay for that tax exposure, it's always going to be cheaper to buy it now, more than likely, because you're going to be younger. And you know, un- unless you uh, you become you know a triathlete as you get older, which most of us don't, you're usually not going to be as healthy when you get older. It's just it, unfortunately yeah, that's mort- the way it works. Yeah, mortality right? gets worse every day, and that's yeah. what I share with people. If you wait too long, if the insurance discussion is on the table, to Michael's point. The cheap, the young, the young you are, the better it is to purchase it because it has more impact. I mean, we've seen a lot of cases, uh, uh, unfortunately, it was fortunately, but unfortunately, in that there was a health issue that wasn't covered after the insurance was put in place. But it, it would definitely would be a situation in which uh, if you didn't have the insurance, you wouldn't be able to get it after these some of these health issues. So it, it does really pay to, again, be proactive with this. It is a challenge because and business owners are running their companies and their families. And it, this is one more thing to think about, but the ramifications can be, can be huge. Right. And, and so that's, again, just hopefully reiterates that, that yeah. need there. Yeah. From a state planning specialist, which, which I think we're in that category, when we look at funding that risk, we typically don't recommend insurance to pay the tax because you're still paying the tax. Mm-hmm. Remember our approach is that we do all the advanced planning to get the tax down to zero as much as we can. But this is one of the cases we this is some of the cases we come across where we're in a pickle because they're 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 not well enough to get the insurance. They have a ch- huge need, and now we're trying to figure out how to get it. So it's one of those things you really have to as a as a as a family you have to look at how do I protect the things I've created, mm-hmm. especially business owners. That's their biggest biggest focus but they drop the ball along the way again not to not not their fault totally they're just busy running their companies and they need uh, advisors to push them in the right direction and sometimes that's a challenge so so we want to make sure that we we address it as soon as possible on the on the on the planning side uh and michael said way back when in one of our podcasts when you open up your company it's brand new that's when you start thinking about your exit strategy or the what if scenarios because you have to deal with it that whether you whether you think it has value or not, you have to deal with it like it's going to have some value down the road. So you got to plan around it. And so most people don't do that. They wait until it's worth you know fifty times more than it was today, and then they start doing planning and they miss a lot of opportunities. Yeah. yeah. Well, gentlemen, I, I know that we're we're wrapping up our time together, and I want to give you a chance for some closing thoughts. But Michael, I've, I've I don't know if you're aware of this, but I'm in a I've been a triathlete for pretty much my entire life. And what I mean, I didn't know that. Yeah. 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 Yeah, well, I I try to be an athlete. That's how I look at that. That's that's my version of triathlete. <laughs> I like that. Never like come that. to fruition. Just going to let you both know. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, but that, enough about me. What are your closing thoughts for today's podcast for those that are maybe 
contemplating or thinking about, man, it, it sounds complex and they get that analysis paralysis, right? Uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, procrastination is the silent killer in a lot of ways. Uh, what can you offer as far as words of encouragement to get them to, to make a move? And then of course, I'd like your contact information so they can, they can reach out to you. Yeah, I think it, it, it can get complicated and it ultimately goes back to what the family wants to accomplish, right? I don't think there's any right answers when you're going through planning. It's really, you have pros and cons a lot of times. And so that analysis paralysis uh, that you mentioned, Eric, is a real thing. And sometimes families don't want to go to that complex level. And mm -hmm. I think that's fine. There's, again, pros to that and there's cons to that. But I think there's usually... Another option, if you don't want to go to that high level of detail and high level of complexity, that I think can still be better than doing nothing at all. And so I think that even if you are listening to this and you know some of the things we talked about sound really complicated, uh, there might be an option for you even without that. It's just important to really at least at the very least be aware of what your exposures are uh, at, the, at the end of the day, because that I think is, you know, half the battle is understanding where you sit and what the exposures might be before you even take it in action one way or the other. Yeah. But my final thoughts would be anybody that is listening to this podcast, um, go back to your advisors, sit them down and say, what am I not looking at to help our families? I'd go back to your attorneys, your CPAs, or as part of your team, have a conversation with them and say, listen, I want to look at this. I want to understand all my options. I want to protect my family going forward that I don't make these these mistakes. Uh, and I'm going to put, put a burden to my my you know, my children and my grandchildren because I did, wasn't paying attention. So go back to your advisors and push them. Uh, be 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 proactive. That's my final yeah, I think particularly not to, not to cut you off there, Dad, but I think it, to echo what you just said, particularly in the business succession arena, mm -hmm. because I think that is an area that we often see that there's a gap in the advisor team in terms of what advisors are in place that, that want to handle that issue. Um, I think a lot of advisors are more than capable of handling. It just isn't something that comes natural to them as a part of their relationship or engagement with the client. So I think to your point that take the initiative of you as the family and, and demand that from your advisors to, to have them focus on it because it's, vitally important and if you have advisors that, that that really can't adapt to that or don't have the skill set or to handle it uh, you need to find a specialist to help you do that because yeah. it's too critical if you don't do it yep absolutely all right how do they reach out to you you can reach us on uh, linkedin we both my father and i have have profiles there if that's your social media outlet of choice you can always reach out to us there uh, if you're um want to call us on the phone, you can call us at area code 856-988-8300. And our website address is www.cbfgllc.com. All right. Sounds good. Guys, thank you so much for your time today. Great topic, great example, and sounds like a really great family. Yeah, they are. Absolutely. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Eric. It was a pleasure. You bet. And of course, our last thank you always goes to you listening audience. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Truth About Wealth podcast with John and Michael Paris. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when John and Michael come out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. And we humbly ask that you share this podcast, rate it, and leave a review, as this actually helps others find the show. Again, thank you so much for listening today. For everyone at Copper Beach Financial Group, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Truth About Wealth podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Copper Beach Financial Group. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. This material is for informational purposes only. Neither APFS nor its representatives provide tax, legal, or accounting advice. Please consult your own tax, legal, or accounting professional before making any decisions. Copper Beach is not affiliated with American Portfolios Financial Services, Inc. and American Portfolios Advisors, Inc. Securities offered through American Portfolio Financial Services, Inc., a member of FINRA SIPC, 
investment advisory and financial planning services offered through American Portfolio Advisors, Inc., an SCC registered investment advisor. These opinions are subject to change at any time without notice. Any comments or postings are provided for informational purposes only and do not constitute an offer or a recommendation to buy or sell securities or other financial instruments. Readers should conduct their own review and exercise judgment prior to investing. Investments are not guaranteed, involve risk, and may result in a loss of principal. Past performance does not guarantee future results. Investments are not suitable for all types of investors. Copper Beach is an unaffiliated entity of American Portfolios Financial Services, Inc. and American Portfolios Advisors, Inc. Any opinion expressed in this forum is not the opinions of American Portfolio Financial Services, Inc. and American Portfolio Advisors, Inc. and have not been reviewed by the firm for completeness or accuracy. These cases may not be representative of other clients. There is no assurance your experience will be similar and no assurance of financial success.